from the very beginning, I had a feeling that I will survive in the camp and in the wagon. And already in, in, in the brick factory in the wagon, I kept on seeing a light coming towards me in, from the far distance, but coming nearer and nearer. And this light kept on occurring again and again mm -hmm. at night during the day from very far distance, but it, it seems to come nearer. <laughs> and the same light was very near to me when I reached Haifa in this illegal boat. Yes. Uh, it never left me, and then it left me. <laughs> it's a funny occurrence. I never forget it. Is. Uh, a kind of a, a torchlight, very far first, very much coming nearer and nearer. And yeah, this, this light always was with me. <laughs> In January 1946, my mother, Zisi Dum, stood on the deck of the Enso Sereni, en route from Italy to Haifa. And as she stood out at night, she saw a light from the distant shore. This was the same light that she had often seen in her darkest moments over the past years when she would close her eyes and see a twinkling star, a glimmer of hope that gave her strength. And here she was standing out on deck and she saw that light, but her eyes were wide open and she knew she was home. More than 20 years later, when I was nine years old, she told me her story in detail. And that's what I'm gonna tell you now. She was born in 1924 in Mukachevo. Today, that's part of the Ukraine. Before the First World War, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But in 1924, it was the new state of Czechoslovakia, a democratic state, where she grew up with a happy childhood. She was the youngest of 10 children, born to an Orthodox Hasidic family. Here you can see the only surviving photos of my family, her family. The man with the wonderful white beard, is my great-grandfather, her grandfather, Duvid Schlissel. And the woman in the photo on the right is her mother, Chaya Edel, my grandmother, who I never met. As I said, hers was a happy childhood, playing on the streets, going to a mixed school where she would play with Jews and non-Jews, and she felt included. But that was soon to change. When I think of it, how uh, that we, we lived so happily and, and uh, peacefully with our neighbors, and they, they towards us as well, with a concern. And yet, when it came to it, there was nobody, all the doors were shut, all the windows tightly shut, nobody came out, afraid, and, and, and in no time they could change their attitude to, from, from friendliness to hatred, I suppose to justify their feelings, uh, or that they, can't, that they can't help us, then they serve them right, because they are Jews. That's a frightening thing, one, yes, one feels yeah. one has uh, nice neighbors, reliable neighbors, and they can turn in no time. Yeah. But not that I accuse them, yes, I can understand it. But I, I may have uh, acted the same way, who knows if I have children and I want to protect them. But still, it's, it's a frightening thought. And so in 1938, when that land, Mukachevo, was handed back to the Hungarians through an agreement between the Allies and Germany. Everything changed. By 1939, Zisi was no longer allowed to go to school. She had to wear this yellow star. She could no longer walk on the pavement. She had to walk in the road. 
Jews were not allowed to congregate. They were not allowed to go out at night. Life became very difficult. And by 1942, all the young men had been sent away to forced labor camp. And her oldest sister who had moved to another town to get married, they heard nothing from her. And Zisi's mother became very worried about all her children. In 1942, they also lost their family store, the fabric store, and they no longer had a means of survival. That was the position for all Jews. They were no longer allowed to own businesses or work. In January 1944, Zisi's mother became very ill. She had pneumonia. They tried to call a doctor, but nobody came out because of the curfew. And finally, when one doctor agreed to come, it was too late and Zisi's mother died. Perhaps she was fortunate because she didn't need to face what was to come. April 1944, Zisi remembers sitting around the Seder table with her father, two sisters and four children. And they heard German soldiers entering the town. They had taken over, calling out, Yido, Yido, Jews, Jews, get out, you Jews. And the next morning, they were told to pack their belongings, close up their houses, and move to the ghetto on the other side of town, where they shared a room with another family. All they had was the food that they bought with them. It was dangerous to go on the streets. Jews were having their beards pulled out and they were constantly attacked. And so they waited. And after two weeks in the ghetto, they were lined up in rows of five and marched out of the ghetto towards the brick factory. As soon as we were out of the ghetto, we, we heard snows and on, on the whole way, which is, was quite a distance to the, to, to the place where we were supposed to be taken, which was a brick factory near the railway station. And a good 20 minutes walk. We were beaten and chased the whole way through and falling all over, screaming all over each other. We were falling and we were screaming and, and they were screaming, schneller, schneller, hurry up, hurry up, faster, faster. And with heavy sticks, they, they kept on beating us, children, old people, uh, women. I only remember that we all uh, were so bewildered. We were uh, such terror that we just, how we managed to run, I don't know. Even the children managed to run, and then we had those three uh, children and, and the neighbor's children. Uh, he, he just kept on protecting my father by, by stretching out my arm. If, if there is a blow, it should fall on me or the children or fishy. He was constantly with me. Um, so we were chased all through the town. We passed in our house, which I had a, a glimpse to look back. And we were chased like, like cattle, really. And so they arrived at the brick factory and were forced to sleep out at night. And they stayed there for three days. And every day a train would pull into the station a train with cattle trucks. But what they heard from those trucks were the cries of people calling for help, for water. Vasa, vasa, bisela vasa. Water, help, please. And Zisi and her young nephew, Fishy, tried to get close to those people in the carriages to give them water, but they were constantly beaten back. And so they waited. And finally, on the third day, a train pulled into the station and they were ordered to climb into those trucks. They were pushed in, standing room only, a small bucket in the corner for them to relieve themselves. And so their journey began. And 
the train started and stopped and started and stopped as it traveled on its journey. It was stifling, it was hot, there was no air to breathe. And after a couple of days of hearing children crying and hearing the elderly calling out for help, Zisi felt that she couldn't hear this anymore and she closed her eyes. And she saw a little twinkling star. That was the light that she saw so many years later en route to Haifa. And here she saw that little light and it gave her a glimmer of hope. And so the journey continued until they arrived. And suddenly the doors opened and it was heaven. Suddenly fresh air, but it didn't last long. Within split seconds, uh, screaming, heroes, heroes, uh, uh, bald-headed man jumping onto, uh, onto the wagon and pushing us brutally out, speaking Yiddish, striped uh, uniform, um, and, and often they came uh, quietly and, say, and, and told us to, uh, to take care, uh, don't, don't cry too much, tell the, that uh, your son is 15, 16, not 12. Uh, they kept on giving us advice what to do and how to save ourselves. As they were called couples, or, or maybe they weren't couples. But um, I, I, I hear such a lot of condemning those people who were already three or four years in Auschwitz. They did their best to advise us, but in order to survive, they had to show to the Germans that they are really brutal. Only those could survive, that, that showed brutality to their own fellow men. So they started pushing us out through the, the door and our luggage thrown out after us. As soon as we stepped out, we were so bewildered again. We just wanted to, the family to be together and we kept on screaming each other's name. And uh, <laughs> the people did the same, so there was a lot of screaming. Um, as, as we walked, as we were pushed to, to walk, um, we were uh, ordered to form uh, five in a line, in a row. Um, I saw lying on, on the ground uh, a lot of men, and they kept on repeating, if you ever survive, tell the story, what they did to us, tell them. People lying on the, on the ground, you know, blood oozing from them. In no time we were all that men and boys separate, women and children separate. And then I, I, saw, I, I saw my father and Fishy going to his best friend, Neumann Berchi was his name, a wonderful man, going on one side and I waved to them and we, we all said, be seeing you, be seeing you. And then, and then the same happened to my sister Gizzy uh, and her three children. She went to on the on, on they separated us, mothers and children. And she too said, "Be seeing you. We will probably get together on the other side somehow." We all hoped that was the last I saw of my father and Fishy and Gizzy and her Yuriko, Miriam and Eva. And so Zisi and her sister Malchi remained together and were marched into the camp. They were forced to strip naked and they had their heads shaven. In terror, Zisi looked around for her sister Malchi and couldn't see her. She screamed out her name and found this woman next to her calling her name. They fell into each other's arms, realizing that they hadn't recognized each other with no hair. And they promised each other, laughing at how ridiculous they looked, they promised each other that they would always stay together. They were then marched into a barrack, just like this one. Eight women to a bed. And I remember my mother telling me, laughing, how actually it was lucky that they were so squashed together. 
because they kept warm. But the only way they could fit was if they lay on their sides. But lying on their sides, she laughed, they had to call out if they wanted to turn over, and so everybody would turn. And there they stayed for the next three weeks. Every morning, noon and evening, they were called to a pal, made to stand for at least an hour each time, given a piece of bread and a bowl of soup for the whole day. Finally, after those three weeks, Zisi and Malchi were chosen, boarded a train, and after a day arrived at Stutthof concentration camp. This camp was renowned for a very cruel commandant called Mad Max. The soldiers in this camp took delight on playing tricks on the women. They would make them stand out in the midday sun for several hours, give them stale bread, and then close off the toilets except for one, so that the women would have to queue and anybody who soiled themselves while waiting was beaten. Luckily, they were only at Stutthof for 10 days. They were then put on another train and arrived at the women's camp near Bidkosh called Branau. Branau camp was five kilometers from a munitions factory and every morning the women were marched to this munitions factory. Here you can see a photo, a modern day photo of the factory, which is now a tourist site so that people can visit the secret underground tunnels where bombs and munitions were made. And there my mother and the other women took great delight in being taught by fellow prisoners of war how to disable the bombs that they were tasked to make. And I remember not quite believing my mother when she told me that she disabled a bomb. Whose mother knows how to disable a bomb, I thought. But I asked her and her sister living in New York and separately they described exactly the same action where you put your hand inside, you find this candle-like structure and underneath there's a little switch and you click it and the bomb is disabled. And that's how they worked. I asked her how they felt in the evenings and what they would talk about in the barracks. And she told me that they were always hungry and so the only thing on their mind was food. And they would compare recipes and they would argue as to whose cheesecake recipe was the best and whose chicken soup was the best. And there was one woman who found a photo of a loaf of bread and stuck it beneath her bunk so she could see it on the underside of her bunk. And she would lie there and breathe in loudly as if she was smelling the smell of freshly baked bread. And it was in those moments that the women would promise each other that when they survived, not if they survived, but when, they would always carry a loaf of bread with them wherever they went. By February 1945, the German guards were getting very anxious. There was news that the Russian armies were getting closer. And so from one day to the next, they rounded up the prisoners and started marching them north with the aim of taking them towards the Baltic Sea to destroy the evidence. The march was very difficult. They were constantly being screamed at to run. There was snow on the ground, it was freezing cold. They had no coats and no proper shoes. And after two days of this relentless march, my mother told me how she sat on a wall and again, she wanted it to end. She couldn't go on and she closed her eyes and she saw that little twinkling star. And she felt her sister shaking her. And she came out of it and she knew she needed to continue. But it was there that the women decided that they couldn't go on like this and they needed to get away from their guards. 
And so a couple of hours later, when they saw the opportunity, they ran into the nearby woods. They dispersed and ZC and Melchi ran in one direction and found a wall and hid behind that wall and waited. And they waited two hours and nobody came to find them. And so they then got up and started running as far away as they could from their captors. But they couldn't get very far. They were exhausted. They were hungry. And they saw a house and knocked on the door, hoping that they would get help. There was no answer, but the door was ajar. And they pushed it open, went in, and to their surprise, they saw food on the table and a fire still lit. And they sat and they ate and they ate and they ate. And they were extremely sick after that. But they had a roof over their heads and they were able to rest. A few days later, some Russian soldiers passed by the house and they told the women that it was not safe for them to be there and that they should go towards the nearest refugee camp. But Zisi and Malchi didn't want to go to another camp. They wanted to go home. And so they started that long journey across Poland to the new Russian border so that they could get home. They traveled on trains, they hitched rides, but all the while they were very aware of the victorious Russian soldiers who only wanted two things, alcohol and women. And so they had to be very careful. But finally, they made it home. And on arrival at Mukach, they went straight to their house. But of course, their homecoming was not what they had dreamt of. The house was in ruins, the windows smashed. Everything had been taken. There was hardly a roof and all her father's learned books, the pages had been pulled out and shred all over the garden. They left the house as soon as they could and went into town, not wanting to go back and see it again. And there they looked for news of their family and they met their brother, Moishi, who was waiting for them. And together they waited. They waited for news. And a couple of days later, their sister Shari, who had been hiding in Koshitse, came to greet them and take them to her apartment in Koshitse. And there again they waited for news. But the news was not good. Everybody now she's we didn't know what happened to others, of course. We heard about the gas chamber, but we we wouldn't take it in. We we saw uh, the the chimney and we smelled. Uh, the smell was always horrible, or flesh smell. Uh, but we didn't want to take it in. And then it started. We started realizing really that it is. It's it's true. And it so it happened that. Uh, one feels guilty. It, it's not a pleasant thing to survive other, other people, especially children. The, the town was, what, you didn't see a Jew. It used to be full of bearded Jews and lots of children humming, uh, playing, screaming, crying. Mm. Nothing in, in the street, of, uh, only a few non-Jewish children. They kept very quiet. They felt uncomfortable. And whenever walking the streets, and we remembered our, uh, especially the children. Then we already knew that the children uh, didn't survive at all. And so in this terrible situation, after several weeks, Zisi decided that she needed to move on. She had always wanted to go to Israel. And so she left a note at night not wanting to break the news of her departure to her brothers and sisters. 
and she joined a group of young people from Hashomer Hatzair. And together they crossed Europe until they reached Italy and boarded the Enso Sereni en route to Palestine. Her story in Palestine and then fighting in the Israeli independence war is another story that I can't tell you now. But in 1952, after several years of separation from her dear sister Malchi, she decided to go and visit her. She was living in Tangier and she boarded a boat from Haifa to Italy and she met a young man called Asher, a young refugee from Germany who was living in London. And over the next few months, they remained in touch until she decided to join him in London. And you can imagine, this was a big change for her. Yet another start in life. And with no English language, she needed to express herself. And so she joined art school and started to express herself through sculpture. At first, she did portrait sculpture, but she found that rather restrictive. And soon she developed abstract forms and semi-abstract figures. And often those figures were crouching figures, refugees, protected by a ring. But after a while, it was as she'd broken free because that ring started to open out and then it disappeared and she produced this series called Man Against the Odds. And always in her work, there was a human figure. She wanted to so show something positive, that there was something positive in, in humans that there's a lot of good in people. And much of her work became a memorial, standing in churches, cathedrals and synagogues, always dedicated to victims of oppression, such as her family and those 10 nieces and nephews that did not return. And it's her story that made me understand how important it is to remember not only those survive, that survived, but also those that didn't. And when I think of my extended family and my husband's family, the Kraut and Senensieg family, 16 members and only five returned. And it made me understand why my mother wanted her work to mean something more than just be a memorial about her family. She wanted us to understand the wider picture. How in Mukachevo, Tony 2000 remained and in Zheshov, where my husband's family came from, only 600 remained. And how 560,000 in Hungary and 3.2 million in Poland were murdered. And so we need to understand the broader picture and remember that for every Jew that survived, three didn't. And yet again, she wanted us to remember all victims of Nazi oppression. It was very important to her that her sculpture have a purpose, a purpose beyond just her and her family, that it be there to tell the generations to come together, to be aware and not to let it happen again. She wanted 
people not only to commemorate the horrors of persecution worldwide, but to try and promote understanding and goodwill between faiths. That that purpose and that her sculpture be a testimony and help people learn that persecution and discrimination has no place in our society. And so I'm here to tell you about generation to generation. We are a new organization. And in fulfilling my mother's legacy and the legacy of so many other survivors and victims, we want to enable the continuation of Holocaust testimony. We want to make sure that that testimony continues to be heard. And we see a role for the second and third generations to tell their parents' stories. And so generation to generation invites second and third generation of Holocaust survivors to join us. We will help you, we will support you to put together a presentation just like this. We will help you do the research. We will help you gain confidence in presenting so that we can then place you in schools, religious institutions and civic institutions so that you can tell that story and that you can ensure that the lessons of racism and discrimination are applied today and that young people learn for the future. So if you're interested in telling your family story, please do contact us. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening.